something which is not the point of view, so please be kind to me. Uh, so it's geometric analysis in a way. Uh, so this is inverse problem. So it got some flavor of inverse problems in this conference, but I understand not everybody is working in this field. Basically, inverse problems, what we want to do is a uh, typical problem will be uh, you stay outside of some domain, stay uh, the boundary, for example, you want to understand what is inside, but you cannot get inside for whatever reason. And you want to measure or get what is inside just by measurements of the boundary. So this is a, those are not all inverse problems, but this is, this is a typical one. And here, that thing that you want to understand is uh, Lorentz manifold. Okay, so I'll start with the remaining case because. Uh, uh, before you understand the Lorentzian case, uh, you want to uh, see what happens in the remaining case, which is actually well studied. There are a lot of works in that direction and some very good results. So we start with that. So this is just introduction. So what is the lens of scattering rigidity problem, also related to so-called boundary rigidity problem? So we have a manifold, let's say compact manifold with boundary. Uh, and uh, some metric inside which can change. And uh, what we do is take point and direction, unit direction, you shoot, you, like, you assume that it exits, so it's not wrapping. And then the exit point is Y, W here in this case. And you have this so-called scattering relation which maps initial points and directions to outgoing points and directions. Okay. And uh, you also you may want to measure the travel time, which is just the length of this path, right? uh, which will be additional function. Uh, of course, this could be a little bit overdetermined, but at this point, let's say you know all this. And uh, a better way to do is to project uh, uh, those velocities to the tangent uh, space on the boundary, because they unit vectors by assumption, and if you know the projections, you know the vectors, of course. Uh, the point inside. Uh, so, uh, in other words, uh, I'm thinking about the scattering relations mapping tangential projection to tangential projections. The same thing about the length of so the travel time. And uh, uh, MG is called scattering rigid. Again, M is fixed. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to consider any fancy topologies, whatever. M is fixed. Uh, G changes uh, in most of the works, but uh, in that definition, okay, so it also you may want to recover M. So M is scattering rigid if the scattering relation determines this manifold uniquely up to an isometry which fix the boundary point wise. Why? Okay, obviously if you uh, have a isometry inside, you're not going to see it, uh, you're not going to affect the data, so this is not that uh, can go wrong, roughly speaking. So this is a uh, uh, what it means to be less rigid, and uh, you want to understand if actually that's some cause of manifolds. And uh, what is less rigid, the same thing, but uh, uh, you use L as an additional piece of information as well. You add L to the data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the boundary rigidity problem? Uh, now your information is the distance between boundary points, pairs of boundary points. <coughs> if there is unique minimizing geodesic, we call that simple manifold, uh, then that will be the unique geodesic that uh, connects them, but uh, in principle it doesn't have to be. Uh, but if it's not, then I think uh, it's hard to analyze. So most of the time when we talk about boundary rigidity, you actually assume that there is unique minimizing geodesic between every two boundary points. And you want to record the metric given the boundary distance function. So this is basically L, the function L that I had before, but you just parameterize differently, parameterized by endpoints. So if you just start counting variables, and this is what you 
do very often inverse problems before you try even to solve the problem. Uh, locally, the boundary distance function maps uh, uh, R2a minus 2 because this is the degrees of freedom of, of pairs uh, of boundary points to R because it's a scalar function. And the Lenz relation uh, still depends on 2a minus 2 variables, uh, but it's a vector valid uh, map, right? It uh, takes you locally to R and 2 minus 2, so it has seemingly it has more information, but actually it doesn't. So S has a structure, obviously. Uh, it's a simple like map, and it's actually a canonical relation of the corresponding hyperbolic Dirichlet number map, which is associated with the wave equation, uh, with G, associated with G. But I'm not studying wave equations here, right? So this is just pure geometry problem. Uh, but anyway, S has some structure, and be because of that, those extra uh, dimensions here, uh, they're basically an illusion, so you don't really get more information. Uh, so, uh, if X and Y are not conjugate along uh, some geodesic connect in them, we can define uh, rho locally. Uh, I mean, ideally it will be the minimum, it will be the distance, but actually it can maximize the distance. You can have the sphere and uh, points here, it, it can be that, right? Uh, so, and for what is, for this relation here, it doesn't really matter if it minimizes or maximizes. Uh, so, but anyway, consider that it's actually the actual distance, uh, and those points are not conjugate, then S uh, can be expressed in this way. In other words, if you know rho, you can express S in this way, which is basically <coughs> say that uh, rho is the generating function of this map. In, in other words, uh, it's enough to know rho to find s, and if you know s, actually, you can show that you can recover rho itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so knowing those two functions, at least under some geometric assumption, is the same thing. So in other words, s doesn't really give more information. Okay. Uh, so the boundary distance function has another advantage, and that's actually really much more important for, for me. Uh, if you want to solve the inverse problem, actually, you want to recover the metric using this information. And it's a nonlinear problem, and the first thing that you should try is to linearize. I'm not saying this is the only thing that you should try, but you should try that at least. And if you linearize near a background metric, uh, we get this nice looking exit trace of two tensor fields. So F is the perturbation of the metric, which is symmetric to tensor field. And well, gamma the geodesic, obviously. And let's say you know that over all the <coughs> boundary points. And now the question is, uh, can you find f knowing that? So it's a linear problem, integral geometry problem that can be studied in a lot. Now, if you linearize the scattering relation, we get something which is much uglier than that. We get uh, something that looks like this, but there are x derivatives of f and they're terms that don't have x derivatives. There's some weight in front of the gradient of f. And actually, those weights are some Jacobi fields. It's, it's an unpleasant transform to work with. You can work it, you can analyze it, uh, but uh, why we want to do that if you can just do this? If you say, okay, but we have to assume the conjugacy of the boundary points. That's not a big deal because if they are conjugate along some geodesic, uh, first thing in, uh, in this problem we recover all derivatives of the metric, the full depth of the metric in some, let's say, normal coordinates. And then you can extend the metric in known way. And then you can just push a little bit uh, uh, one of the points outside and they're not conjugate anymore. You can still do that. Okay, so uh, again, uh, this is just introduction. Talk about the remaining case, which is not really the topic of my talk, uh, but uh, it has a very long history. Uh, so the lens scattering about the rigid has been studied by a lot of people. First, it appears in uh, application of geophysics, those are words that are essentially old. And then Mohammed of Romanov and so on. This is the Novosibir school from the 1670s, and many other names here and many more that should have been there, but they're not. Uh, 
Uh, it is known that in a neighborhood of an open dense set of simple matrix, this is just one of the results, including real simple, uh, real analytic ones, we have uniqueness. What is simple again? No conjugate points inside, and let's say strictly convex boundary. And uh, there is another condition which uh, guarantees that this is uniquely solvable. So called Fourier condition. This is a recent work that started with work by uh, Ullman and Vashi, and then there's a work with them and me as well. Uh, I'm not going to describe this uh, in detail, uh, but uh, anyway, in some classes manifolds, we know that the answer is S. We can regard the metric up to isometry. You can even do it locally. This is quite interesting and quite hard actually to prove. Now, if we linearize, you get this integral geometry problem. And can be studying a lot as well, and there are a lot of results, but there are no complete answers still, in a way. Uh, and, uh, but under some conditions, geometric conditions, we have injectivity and stability, which is really important if you want to solve it, not only a problem but linearization, you want injectivity uh, of the derivative, after speaking, but that's not enough. It's enough in finite dimensional spaces, but in finite dimensional spaces, you want some kind of a priori estimate, which doesn't come for free. Sometimes it's not true. Okay, so partial data problems can be studied and understood, uh, and contribution of conjugate points is also understood to some extent, but I don't want to go there. Okay. Now, what about the Lorentz version of that? Well, you have to formulate it first uh, properly. Uh, so this is a uh, like cylindrical version of the manifold with boundary. So the boundary is uh, uh, what is time like here. I think about uh, this being time, roughly speaking. I'm not really assuming that there is a time variable, but just intuitively, and this is space. And uh, you should uh, know geodesic, only know geodesic, so it's like geodesic, from boundary points in some all possible directions, they hit somewhere, and the scattering correlation is defined the same way. And again, as before, we really care about the projections, because they, they tell everything. And uh, you may have one space-like surface, another space-like hypersurface, uh, instead of two time-likes. And it's the same kind of problem. And uh, one small problem, there is no natural parameterization, right? So if you have uh, remaining cases, you have to assume that everything moves with unit speed, because changing the speed doesn't really bring anything new. And here, uh, there is no unit speed, the speed is actually zero. And uh, uh, if you rescale some geodesic, again, light-like, right, only light-like, and go to the next one, you rescale it even in a different way, and so on, uh, this is not better or worse than what we had before. So we have this uh, uh, freedom to reparameterize in a way that actually depends on the truth. But anyway, you just uh, define this up to that freedom. And this is how you define the scattering relation. So you can just think of this being homogeneous of order of one and stop worrying about the, uh, the way we parameterize it. Now it is easy for to leave S to the cotagen bundle uh, because some of the techniques are more natural at least to me in the cotagen bundle. And uh, again, if you relate this to the wave equation with this background uh, uh, Lorentz metric, uh, this is actually the canonical relation of the so called Dirichlet to Neumann map that map Dirichlet data to Neumann data. And being canonical relation it has to be symplectic, so you can prove that independently. Uh, and then the question is that I ask at least what is the analog of the boundary distance function? But uh, I have to explain what I mean by that uh, analog, right? So, in the remaining case, there's this very nice object again, boundary distance function, which linearizes nicely. And here, if you start thinking about distance, well, the distance. Well, it depends on what definition you want to give, but the most common definition, the distance between two points connected by no geodesic is zero. Uh, or let me talk about other separation functions, whatever. 
but uh, what I really want uh, from this uh, uh, function is the following. I want this function to be scalar, right? And to determine the scattering relation uniquely and vice versa. I also want to reduce this uh, vectorial uh, f function to scalar function, to not knowing scalar function. I want this to be the generating function of S, which somehow is related to the first uh, requirement. And I also, also want this function to linearize nicely. But that's actually the main point. I want the linearization of that function to give me this transform, uh, where it goes to the same as before. But what is different is that you integrate over a light like geodesics only, right? this tensor field. Uh, and people have been studying, including myself, this transform even before, because we somehow say, okay, in the remaining case, this transform is important, and those are just <laughs> unispeed geodesic in the remaining case. Well, what is the nature of generalization of this transform? Should be that. Let's study it. Uh, but how do you know that it has something to do with some nonlinear problem? Right? And this is my main point here. Uh, I really want to show that this actually linearizes the lens or the scattering rigidity problems will run the case in certain sense. And that sense is the following. I introduce this function here. I have to show, still have to show it exists, of course. And then it linearizes nicely. If we linearize the scattering relation, I guess something much earlier than that, that I don't really want to study. Well, we have studied that in another paper, but you really want to. Okay, uh, uh, let me go back. Uh, there's a slight problem if you really want to solve this problem by linearization. Uh, L is misses time-like singularity, so roughly speaking, uh, you want to see singularity that moves faster than light with light, and that's a problem. Uh, and my colloquial this has very clear explanation. So look at the even the Minkowski case. Look at uh, what we can recover, and actually it's exactly zero, roughly speaking, microlocally on the time like con. It's completely lost from the picture. Okay, so in other words, uh, if you really want to go further and invert that stably, well, there's some problems, and probably have to restrict yourself to subclasses of metrics. But, uh, this will come later. So, it, again, it's problematic to use Lorentz and distance and so on, just because uh, it sounds like distance doesn't mean you have to look for object that looks like distance. Uh, you remember, those are the properties that they postulate. This is, this is what I want. I want those properties. Okay. And uh, so I still simply not conjugate the assumption. Those points are not conjugate along uh, gamma zero. What is gamma zero? This is a fixed light-like geodetic that can make so one of the ways to construct such a function is to look at uh, the set of pairs which are connected by a light-like ray. It's a submanifold uh, under this assumption of co-dimensional one. You can prove that easily. And since, since it's a submanifold of co-dimensional one, uh, it has uh, a lot of generating functions, defining functions. Okay. And just take any defining function, which is zero on that manifold and has no zero definition. And uh, this is just a sign convention, not really a big deal. So this is one way to define R, of course, not unique. And uh, if you do that, then uh, we get what I mentioned before, this is condimension one sub manifold. Uh, take any defining function and then uh, Consider this uh, set here. Uh, this coincides locally with the graph of some reduced representation. What do I mean reduced representation? Maybe not really standard. Uh, this uh, S is homogeneous with respect to the fiber variable. Well, think about roughly speaking reducing to the unisphere or something like that. It was uh, reducing to any hypersurface in the, the fiber variable so that if you know it there, it just can be extended by homogeneity. Okay, and uh, then it linearizes nicely. Actually, this is really the property that I want. And there's this conformal factor here that appears. 
you may say, okay, but what do I do with that? First, it's a elliptic factor. And secondly, it can expect to be there because there is no unique parameterization anyway. So in other words, any, any defining function that manifold uh, plays the role of the boundary distance function, roughly speaking, in the remaining case, and linearizes nicely. Okay, this is what I mentioned before. You can expect this to happen, to, to have this non uniqueness. Okay, so the graph of uh, S, uh, I mean, again, this thing there just means uh, sharp, means that it's the cotangent bundle. Uh, this is just a twisted conormal bundle of, of uh, uh, N prime. Prime means twisted. Twisted means what? In micro local language, it means you have two fiber variables just change the sign of one of them. It's kind of and this only follows from previous work if you just think about this being the canonical <coughs> relation of certain map related to the wave equation, but there's no wave equation. Here we just get this directly. And this follows from the formula that I had before, right, to describe the graph. And then you see that the scattering relation determines R uniquely up to an elliptic factor, and that non-uniqueness can be expected again. And the other hand, that each defining function determines S uniquely. In other words, that's the object that replaces S, is a scalar object, and linearizes nicely. So it's too cold. Okay, so now we really can start studying L from now on. And the proof, proof is constructive uh, in a way. Uh, it, it can just pass to energy, so for any curve, you consider the energy functional. And this is Lorentzian case, so the energy functional doesn't really minimize or maximize whatever. Uh, roughly speaking, it's uh, not like a saddle point, well, without making this precise. But anyway, it's a critical point. Each uh, geodesic is a critical point of this functional. And this is all I need. If you try to linearize it, this is a pretty simple calculation. You differentiate, you have family of functions and, sorry, family of metrics. Each one defines family of geodetic, semi endpoints. And then if you differentiate first uh, the metric, you get F by definition. If you differentiate the dependence on the geodetic on the perturbation, then you get zero because uh, this is a critical point of view. I mean, this is well known the remaining case. Of, sorry, it works more or less the same here. And in other words, uh, if I just take the energy along uh, uh, geodesic connecting boundary points, not necessarily not geodesic, uh, then this uh, plays the role of uh, such a function. So this is one choice of defining function. A every other choice is just multiple by elliptic factor. Okay, so if you go back to the remaining case, let's say this is uh, remaining manifold, and then you just add the T variable. So this is a product case, of course. Uh, you have full separation variables. Uh, uh, no really need to worry about time space, but if you really want to understand this in this context, uh, then uh, th that will be the defining function here. So this is the boundary distance function on the base, roughly speaking. T minus s are two different times. And r is zero if and only if those two points are connected by light like geodesic. And you can also take this Thing, which is basically that multiplied by some elliptic uh, function. No matching, right? And if you want to take the energy, well, this is just another factor that you apply to, let's say, R1. So all those are three choices of boundary of defining function, and they all give you the same scattering relation, obviously. Okay, uh, now. Uh, so now with this uh, function now, uh, going back to Lorentz and Lorentz rigid. It's invariant under some transformations. You want to understand what group of transformations leaves invariant. And this is well known, so, but I really need to repeat it because it connects to everything else that is coming. <coughs> First, it's invariant under diffeomorphisms. Uh, you want to fix uh, what is U of V? That's a piece of the boundary because everything is over here. 
And if the diffeomorphism fixed the boundary of respect to the cylindrical boundary or just pieces of this point wise, uh, of course you don't see it from the date. Okay, this is what we have in the remaining case as well. It repeats here. Not a surprise. If we linearize this near metric, what we get at the linearization should vanish on so called potential vector fields. And those are just symmetrized uh, covariant derivatives of uh, uh, vector fields which vanish on the boundary. Again, absolutely the same thing in the remaining case. This is not surprising at all. So, in other words, uh, this is one group of diffeomorphism that. Uh, doesn't change the data for the nonlinear problem, which gives you some components of the kernel of the linearization. And again, that, that is known in, in the remaining case. What is new here, and again, that is well new because you're passing from Romanian to Lorenzian, but uh, for people working in that area, that's not new. Uh, you have uh, freedom to do conformal changes. If you multiply the metric with some conformal factor, let's say positive, because you don't want to change the what is future, what is past. Uh, then uh, C changes the parameterization of uh, light like Judith, <coughs> but leave them the same as curve, which is kind of well. <coughs> uh, and you can derive from here that the scattering relation is preserved. Again, if you think about what happens inside the manifolds at any given time, if you want to call that time, uh, Points will be different positions, maybe, but they the exit the same point, same direction, so you're not going to see the boundary. So you have this conformal invariance, uh, and if you linearize this, we get that the, this uh, the should uh, vanish on con uh, multiples of the metric, conformal multiples of the metric, but that's absolutely obvious because this just is zero point wise, right? In other words, uh, those are the expected uh, non uniqueness classes for the nonlinear for the linearization. And uh, what we have to do is to prove that in some cases this is all, nothing else, which is not easy. And uh, now scattering rigidity will mean the following. If you have the same scattering relation, then, uh, then the matrix refers as a matrix to each other up to some conformal factor. This is conjecture, right? So this is not a theorem so far. And uh, S injectivity, this call calling for the linearization, will be if LF equals zero. Remember, L was that transform of vector fields, right? Along the uh, Then F must be so called potential field, and this just for fundamental theory of Kaku, that should be in the kernel, plus conformal multiple of the matrix, which is also obvious. I think that should be there because it vanishes point-wise, but there shouldn't be anything else. Uh, so this is the, what we want to prove. That doesn't mean that we have proven it for all metrics. Okay. Uh, now, what we know about the linearized problem first. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is this micro-local blind spot you cannot see time-like singularities, which is a problem because you lose stability when you have a stability estimates. Uh, stable inversion is not possible. We know that for sure. It's a theorem, well, quite obvious, unless we assume uh, some additional structure. And there's a paper by Anders who was here the first few days and uh, Ian and Wang. Uh, they assume some that you have a function, not really a tensor field, that solve some additional differential equations, comes from some physical problem. And under if it has additional structure, okay, then you might be able actually to do it. Excuse me, what do you call uh, time lag singularities? Time lag singularities of what? Uh, okay, uh, I mean, physically it also be singularity that move faster than light and in terms of micro-local terms, there's a co-vectors that, uh, uh, let's see, to do it carefully. Yeah, that basically point in this cone, rather than being here, right? And this is the light light cone. And injectivity of functions, in the Minkowski case, was proven a long time ago. Uh, in partial analytics of the Fourier transform in Xi, what is Xi? It's a dual of X, and it uh, assume that uh, this is supporting cylinder, and then uh, this uh, helps uh, extend 
this extends to analytic metrics, and there's some convex correlation assumption, uh, using analytic microanalysis, which is quite involved. And uh, it's done also for one forms for Jim Minkowski, and so this is one of my students. And also in this work here, we do micro analysis for Lorenzo metrics. Well, functions is not actually invertibility, we just studied the uh, resolution of singularities. Also for two tensors for this expanding matrix, this model for expanding universe. And of course, the blind spot, roughly speaking, is still there, right? But we show that you can recover everything else up to the Gauss transformations. And then the paper that I just mentioned by uh, Wang and Vashi, and then another paper by Wang, some partial results as well. And then this paper here, and probably Laura will say something more in his uh, talk. Uh, so the result for stationary metrics, again, for the linear problem. In particular, injectivity to gauge for two tensors for compact support. Compact support in space and time. In some cases, which includes Minkowski, but actually more general as well. So again, he would probably say more about this. Uh, and now I'm passing to the second uh, part of my talk, which is not directly so much related to the first part, but is still the same problem. Uh, Legitimate for station, stationary <coughs> metrics. In other words, mm, there is a very little hope that you can solve this problem at least by linearization. Uh, the greater generality because the linearization is unstable. That doesn't mean that there is no uniqueness, but at least there is no stability we know that. Uh, okay, so you really want to study some subclasses, maybe. And. Uh, one of them is, let's say, stationary metrics. First, uh, the uh, invariant definition is a little bit more involved. You use some global hyperbolism and so on. I'm just going to make it simple. Let's say you have a coordinate system in which there is a time, there is a space, and the metric looks like this. Stationary means nothing here depends on time. No coefficient depends on time. And the uh, matrix looks like this. Again, all those entries here are independent of time, but uh, it's not really a product case of uh, Riemannian cross minus dt squared because uh, there's this non trivial one form here and there, and also that, okay, which is not a big deal. So, that's a stationary matrix. And, okay, they appear in uh, relativity in some context, and they cannot be reduced. Uh, trivial to the remaining cases, so on. there's a little bit more here. So it is convenient to write uh, this in the following form. I just complete the square, roughly speaking. Uh, and uh, right in this form, uh, where this uh, form is not exactly the same as that, but it can be obtained easily from the previous one. And there are three objects here, the conformal factor lambda, uh, this one form, and the metric H, which is this subblock here after this reduction. And uh, now the conformal factor, I can just eliminate it because it doesn't really change the date. I can just assume it's one, like what we had before. And then there are only two <coughs> parameters left, which is the one form omega and the remaining metric H. And again, this can be derived for some more abstract assumptions, so I'm not going to go there. Okay, so uh, naturally a manifold will be a cylinder because we have this, uh, roughly speaking, time, natural time function, but actually that's not correct. We have natural time vector field, not nat really natural time, we'll get to this in a moment, but anyway, we uh, have such a manifold, uh, which is cut of cylinder, and the boundary is actual cylinder, which is the boundary of N cross R. And then we want to identify all so called natural transformations. I mean, we're just making a guess here. What could possibly be the group of transformations that will preserve the structure? Right? We want to leave the metric stationary. We know what we can expect for general Lorenzo metrics. We just cannot prove it. Uh, but now we want to stay in that class. Okay, so. 
one of them will be diffeomorphism which fix the boundary point wise. Okay, but we want to preserve uh, the class of stationary matrix. So you can assume, and again, we're just guessing at this point, you can assume that actually does the diffeomorphism act in the x variable only. Don't do anything in the t variable. And they preserve uh, the scattering relation, they preserve the structure, it's easy to see. And uh, they also they preserve the boundary. Uh, another group of transformation, let's say you have a function which vanishes um, uh, on the lateral boundary, the spatial component of this manifold. And uh, consider this function here. So we can think of this as uh, x dependent time shifts. I'm going to show a picture in a moment. So for any, any point x, you shift time in a way dependent on x. And this fixes the boundary point right, because we're shifting up and down, and the boundary is still in the frame. So it's not change it. And it's a different morphism uh, inside. And it preserves the form of the metric. Uh, but it replaces the one form by this, uh, with this factor plus the differential phi. And this says something interesting. So when we think of that there is a natural uh, time variable, that was at least my expectation where it started, but actually that's not true. If there's a natural time the field DDT, obviously. This is where it starts. Uh, but you can actually shift time in a way dependent on x. So you shouldn't really count on the existence of so-called global time, which can shift by constant. Okay. Uh, so uh, now we want to define Gauss equivalent uh, matrix in this class, right? In the stationary class, and eventually want to prove that uh, knowing the scattering data, this determines them up to this class. And this is how I define it. You assume that this is a diffeomorphism. This n, n is the spatial component, right, which fix uh, the boundary pointwise. And a function that comes from uh, here uh, with this property says that the metric, again, this is the metric on the x space, on the space, is just as a metric to the first one. And this one form is transformed this way. You just have another exact form. Uh, and then, of course, this is the homomorphic deformation. So this is what I expect to have if you have the same scattering data, if you want to keep the metric in the same class. OK, so in other words, OK, you want to show that now in the scattering relation determines, uh, implies that those two metrics are gauge equivalent according to this definition. And here is a picture. So the first diffeomorphism just uh, acts on the x variables only. And the other one, uh, x dependent time. And but I assume that this function is uh, zero on the boundary, which means that you don't really shift the boundary up and down. But if you go inside, you, you can do this. OK, so what are the prior results for uh, uh, this kind of problems? Mm -hmm for stationary matrix. First, there is a paper by uh, Faiz Muhammadi in Borint and uh, Lowry, again, who will speak uh, later. And they project uh, the dynamical system onto the base. And I do the same thing. And you get a certain dynamical system there, uh, which doesn't look so nice, but anyway, whatever it is. And then you derive the results about the linear It's about the linearization. And depending on the behavior of that system, when you get when you project. Uh, then this uh, paper by Günther, Young, and Zhu, they use uh, the time separation function. In other words, uh, their data is different. It's not the scattering correlation that uh, you consider. Uh, So-called time separation function, which actually has information about the which is not just light-like. It needs uh, also information about the data that's a little bit, a bit time -like. And some other restrictive assumption, then they show that you can have uh, recovery up to some transformations. 
So again, recall that I write the metric in this form, and you can just take lambda to be one because it doesn't change the data. And I project uh, this on the base as well. Uh, I call it base, okay, quotation mark. Uh, so this is not exactly orthogonal projection; it's just identifying each uh, horizontal, well, each vertical line is time-like traject well, time trajectory by one point. And again, similar to this idea here, I want to see what happens on the base. Do I get some system which somehow, uh, numerical system, which is easy to analyze and then drift it back and get our results? Sorry, what is the timeline? Uh, the timeline is all vertical lines here because the coefficient don't depend on time. So every vertical line on this picture is the uh, point x is fixed and only time changes, like a stationary point which doesn't move in space time. So it just collapses everything vertically by just trivial projection on the base. I mean, here's a picture, right? So if you have some trajectory like this, you just project it down and you want to understand what happens here. Now it turns out that this projection is a magnetic system. I'll put in a moment what that means. And okay, so here I refer to Maciek Zworski, which might be not well known for part of this audience, but uh, uh, he's known for many things, including very nice jokes. And uh, <laughs> what else can it be? And actually, this is not quite a joke, uh, because this is the way I write to, uh, this in the first place. I look at this and say, there's a metric, remaining metric, there's a wall form. I have seen that before. <laughs> The system do exactly that. Of course, it doesn't prove that it's a magnetic system yet, but it should be that. And then I said, okay, if it's that, then somebody must have done it. Oh, uh, physicists done that. Yeah, but I found a mathematical paper because it don't trust physicists so much. And there's the book. Caluse applying probably did that. Why? Caluse applying construction. Yeah, but anyway, I found a mathematical paper, which is here. This is pretty old, right, 2007. And the proof is, is perfect. I mean, it's a variational proof. And uh, well, it was new for me because I never really cared about stationary metrics before. And I found that actually there's a mathematical paper which proves that in uh, very half a page. Okay, So I was happy with this. And uh, actually, this paper does a little bit more. Uh, even because uh, it doesn't only study light electrodesics. It's a very nice paper, and there's another one follow up of this one. Yeah, I, I assume that it must have been known before. Uh, and uh, now, uh, I'll explain in a moment in what sense this is a magnetic system, but if you believe that for a moment, uh, this is a system that we started with uh, Gabriel and Dirbekov and Gunther uh, years ago. And we reproved many of the results that were known up to that point in the remaining case to the just translated into the magnetic case. Okay, so what is a magnetic system? Uh, again, there's no time space here, this is just in space, right? Uh, so you think that you have close one form, let's just say it's d omega, omega is uh, given. Uh, form, uh, at least locally is true, and we associate uh, this uh, linear map, which is basically the differential of this form with one the index raised, and the dynamic is given by this. Uh, if this is zero, that will be the actual geodesic, and now y is this Lorentzian force, which is orthogonal to gamma dot. Uh, in other words, it tries to steer the trajectory in the direction orthogonal at any point. And uh, if you have uh, a Euclidean metric, and if uh, this is constant, let's say vector field like this, that's actually some kind of spirals. Actually, not some kind, it's exactly spirals. And of course, if y is zero, there will be lines, right? And the speed is very zero for along the floor. Fix it to be one. Uh, by the way, fix it to be something different, get different curves. Right? Fix it to be one. And if you change the initial speed, okay, I mentioned that. And now let's uh, L be the travel time. And the natural boundary delta is not the travel time, but it's so-called action. And you have to separate this integral of this one form. And in particular, it's invariant with the uh, adding of exact form to omega. 
And then, uh, what do we mean by uh, magnetic systems? Well, uh, this is the natural definition. We actually prove eventually this through many cases, but uh, uh, the metric, one of the metrics is a metric with the other one, and the form is obtained by this uh, freedom field. Uh, and now I'll just sketch, I mean, this is a really long paper, like, I you know, 50 pages, I believe, but uh, just sketch some of the results there. Uh, if we linearize the, uh, this action function, uh, you get the following axial transform. This is what you usually get, but you get this addition. Uh, and you cannot separate them right away, but in a way you can, because it is microlocally, one of them is even, the other one is odd. Uh, so you can actually analyze this. And uh, uh, the action, which is plays the role of the boundary distance function, uh, determines uh, the scattering relation, the magnetic case, and vice versa. We prove that. And S injectivity, now talk about linearized problems, means that F is a potential as before, but uh, about the linearization of the form, we have this, which you can expect, minus YV. V is that V here. And we show that this is true in several cases. Explicit bound of the curvature using uh, energy event inequalities in given conformal class, analytic uh, <coughs> systems using um, analytic micro analysis, and local near generic uh, ones uh, using analytic results. I mean, they have to be near simple generic ones. So, in many cases, I actually prove that. And, uh, get gauging equivalence, now I'm talking about the nonlinear problem, derived linearization. Uh, for two-dimensional simple magnetic system, this is false, uh, proved by Pestoff and Nuna, really nice uh, paper, very smart proof there. Uh, it doesn't linearize anything. Uh, in given conformal class, uh, if you analytic simple magnetic system with the same less data gauge equivalent, uh, you can just determine the jet of the boundary, just extend analytically. And uh, generic local rigidity in your simple magnetic systems, which I mentioned before. In other words, all those cases, uh, not all cases, but we don't even have all cases in the remaining case. Uh, we prove uh, rigidity for the nonlinear problem. And then you can just take all those results and translate them to stationary metrics, which is automatic and there's not much to do there. Just a question. <coughs> the stuff in the line results, you need more than the scattering relation. You also need the boundary distance function. Uh, not if they are simple. It is important. I mean, if you have the scattering relation, then you get the complex structure. And then if you get the conformal factor. You also get the metric. You get, yeah, from the scattering relation, in a simple case, you get the metric. Okay. So, if you go back to stationary matrix to see how all this applies, uh, if you study the geodesic, you separate time and uh, spatial component, then uh, you get this uh, form. And again, this comes from that paper that I mentioned that uh, shows that you get magnetic system. And, well, this is an equation for magnetic geodesics. And once you solve it, then you can go here and uh, solve this one. X is known already. And then you see that. Uh, uh, when you solve this one, knowing x, uh, t actually plays the role of action variable, it's not really time variable. Uh, t, which actually good. t depends on x or time? Or t, uh, okay. t, I mean, I call it t, but, uh, t. well, you can think about time in some coordinate system, yes. No, I'm, so talking, I'm asking about k. Oh, k is uh, something that you think, because uh, uh, you have the right to fix the uh, energy level. Okay, it comes from the following. You, you can reparameterize light like geodesic, keep them light like, right? You just multiply by five, this parameter is still light like, and so on. But if you do that, you go to magnetic system, you may get different one. Uh, so it's a parameter which may change from geodesic to geodesic in principle. But if you fix, uh, you can make it a constant eventually with some Gauss transformation, and then you can just assume it's one, basically, here. But uh, you always have to fight with this uh, non-uniqueness. Okay, uh, one of the main 
during that each one of the quantities, uh, this is a scattering relation for the Lorentz and positive stationary metric. Uh, the magnetic one, which is on the base, roughly speaking, and the action function uh, determines the other two in an explicit way. In particular, knowing the scattering relation, you can recover the action function and then all magnetic results that we know about you. But, uh, you can translate this scattering information to the base and then work with all those results. And here's some theorem which just follow directly from that long paper that I mentioned. So just translate them in, in this language. There's nothing really. Uh, so, knowing the scattering relation, you can uh, G and G had a Gauche equivalent in the sense that I mentioned before. Even only if you can do this for the magnetic system, but then we have so many results for the magnetic system, we can translate all of them. And here's some of those. In dimension one plus one, you have simplicity, you're fine. Uh, in given conformal class, yeah, you can, that's also true. Uh, this is generic results. Uh, if you stay locally near up and down set of uh, simple Stationary metric, simple means what? Projection of the basis, simple magnetic system. Then you have local uniqueness there. And I'll stop here. All right, so any questions for Plamen? So, so I think to your list, you can probably add the one um, just on this final thing, with where you we have a we have a strictly convex function for the magnetic case. Uh, actually, there's a paper about that. I forgot who was the author. So I think Gunter was also involved. So uh, with me, Gunter and Hamin that did it for Young Mills case, but in particular in. No, this paper is exactly about magnetic systems. Maybe even about magnetic and electric also potentially. But but they assume knowing uh, the travel time and the action. Yes, you need to understand. Yeah, and also, I really want only to use, uh, you really want to use only the uh, action. That's indeed in my paper. The same action and the outcome. Uh, yes, that's right. Together. And again, this is about magnetic systems, so it's not about uh, station metrics. If you want to translate to station metric, I want to use the action now. Uh, we don't have the travel time. So my guess it should work, I guess. But there's some additional information that we don't have here. It is a, it is a and you need stability estimates for the, the Lorentzian problem using stability estimates for the magnetic problem? Uh, it should be able to because uh, there's stability results uh, for those magnetic systems. I, I don't know. If we actually formulated this, because we wrote that paper many years ago, but at least in the remaining case, yeah, there's a other type of conditional stability that we get from all those methods. All those methods are stable in principle. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank Plumin again.